joined HR as a profession many, many years ago. In fact, I can say last century. And last century, I also was lucky enough to have a conversation with someone who I'm sure you'll, you'll know, uh, one Gary Hamill. And uh, he's a kind of a consultant, author, professor, etc. I think he's a visiting professor at London Business School and, and also at Stanford, possibly. I'm not quite sure. And uh, very interesting conversation. And he, had, he said something, and we had this conversation around 1996. But what he said has actually shaped my thinking about HR for a, kind of like, you know, the last 20 years. And it's led me to some conclusions, which has also informed how, about, how, how I go about doing my work. So this is what he said. He said, you know, Robert, the thing is about HR is that people think there's an equivalence with the finance function. So finance is about numbers and HR is about people. But he said, the problem is everyone buys in to, if you like, the underlying theory or model about how finance works. There is a universally accepted model for finance along the lines of revenue, cost, profit. And he said, the problem with HR is there is no universally accepted model for what HR is and does. And he said, that's just how it is. HR should get over it. And not only get over it, but actually look to how HR can work with the differences and the uniqueness that each organization presents. So what he meant was that any organization needs to sell stuff or serve, uh, serve customers or clients and do that profitably. But actually, where HR drives value is in understanding the value chain of the business, its marketplace, its products, its competitors, and gets under the skin of that. So what HR should be doing to drive that phrase competitive advantage in professional services is different from a mining company. I wouldn't say it's completely different. I'd say there's about 60, 50% of things that are common across all HR functions. But actually, competitive advantage in a mining company is different from competitive advantage in a retailer. And the role that HR could and should play has to at least play to a 20, 30% difference. Not just difference, but being sharply almost uniquely differentiated. And there's a lot of evidence to back this up. So the route to understanding where that difference should be and how that should inform what HR is and does, I think, is with the evidence. Looking at the evidence, looking at the analytics. And in your packs, you will have uh, a report that we've recently um, produced with the Economist Intelligence Unit, and it's all about evidence-based HR. And, and let me illustrate this point a bit more. Um, with this little anecdote, I'm shamelessly ripping off Daniel Pink, and anyone who's seen his 2009 TED lecture into what motivates and incentivizes people will know where this is going. But I use this to illustrate my point. Um, in about 1940-something, and I can't remember the name of the psychologist, but this is one of those classic psychologists doing experiments on, on people, uh, like Stanley uh, Milgram and, and various others. And, th and this psychologist was doing this, this experiment. On, on people, randomly selected people. And it was to solve this problem. 
and work, understand you know, how efficiently and effectively people solved this problem, whether they did it better in groups or whether they did it better or quicker or um, if they were incentivized, etc. The problem is simply this. Attach the candle to the wall, to a wall, and light it in such a way that wax won't drop onto the floor. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the, the, the TED lecture, you may well be pondering what the answer is, and I'm going to put you out of your misery. And, and let me tell you, you know, there's lots of answers that people offer up, including kind of pinning the candle to the wall in various ways, or trying to stick it to the wall. And the answer is, the graphic doesn't really come out that well, is pin the tray to the wall, stand the candle up in the tray, and light it. Now, the reason I'm, I'm sharing this with you is that uh, what was interesting is that, and, and this has been borne out, this, this test has been used hundreds of times in various contexts. And some of the interesting ones are when you get groups of people trying to solve this and where you incentivize them. So a fairly large randomized sample of people put into groups and one group they just have the glory of solving the problem as their, as their reward. Another group has a moderate bit of incentivization. Let's say they have 25 pounds to share amongst, say, eight people. And then there's another group who have, let's say, 500 pounds um, to, to either share, and another way of doing the experiment is 500 pounds to individuals. So you might argue highly incentivized. And of course, what happens? The group consistently that solves it quickest is the one that had no reward. Next quickest is the one that had moderate reward. And of course, bringing up the rear appreciably slower than the other groups, those that were highly incentivized. And what Daniel Pink, and, and his stuff on incentivization and motivation, if you're interested, is, is well worth exploring. What Daniel Pink says, in particular, is that what that high incentivization does is destroy collaboration. And we see this in organizations. In fact, the phrase that Daniel uses is, what science knows business doesn't do. What science knows business doesn't do. And actually, we know an awful lot of things, particularly, for instance, incentivization in organizations that require collaboration, knowledge-based organizations. Aggressive individual incentivization brings down overall organization performance. It brings it down. It doesn't stop many of us developing quite aggressive, Darwinian incentivization policies to this day. You, you, you'll have seen the debates and arguments in various things like HPR. To rate employee performance or not to rate employee performance? And now I sense this rush of organizations getting rid of their rating scales because it's seen as the thing to do. There's a trend, there's a fashion. And some of you may be thinking it. And um, War for Talent, great quote here from Jeffrey Pfeffer. War for Talent, all the serious longitudinal studies I've seen tend to suggest that things like uh, nine box grids and um, fast track graduate schemes, etc., actually 
not only don't pay back, but actually create a lot of problems in organizations when you look at the entire organizational performance. And I think the problem that's beset HR, the dilemma, if you will, is simply this. We, we as profession, professionals in HR, of course, want to justify our chair at the top table. We want to be seen to be value driving. And we want to be seen more than a back office function. And it does great every time I hear people refer to HR as back office. But the way we've sought to kind of muscle in on that top table is often to unleash initiatives that have very little evidence behind them. And the problem with that is that we aren't able, therefore, to demonstrate what is this latest initiative, 360-degree feedback, new competence scheme, new performance appraisal scheme, without ratings. We're not able to clearly say, what is this going to do to our value chain as a business? And I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to come at this as if, you know, we have to be able to measure everything. I'm not saying that. But if we're to get to really understand that where the 20 to 30% of genuine differentiation occurs, where this competitive advantage is, it'd be a good idea to bring some evidence behind that. And too frequently do we bring that evidence. So we rely on what other people are doing. We rely on best practice. We rely on benchmarks. I think these are a bit of a blind alley. The truly value-driving HR function is the one that you wouldn't want to copy because it's uniquely configured. It's a contention for you. Um, I think you know, this is like the VUCA challenges. So um, a lot of these challenges and this dilemma that I've described about the need to get to the evidence, I think are creating a, a need for HR to really start to systematically get at that evidence and to understand what are the sources of differentiation. And I find it interesting, just, you know, this isn't hard evidence, but it's anecdotal kind of experience. I am seeing many, many more companies coming to us with questions like, how do we set up a workforce intelligence, workforce analytics team in our HR function? What would it look like? What would we do? What would an evidence-based HR operating model look like? How would you change the role of HR business partners in an evidence-based world? It's not us telling the clients they should think about these things. The clients are coming to us saying, can you help us with these questions? I think that's encouraging. And I think the data could well set us free, although I'll come to the dark side of analytics momentarily. Um, our EIU survey that I mentioned, it, w w we are seeing increasing use of data and evidence. It's happening. I don't think, to use the aeroplane analogy, we've lifted off, but we are accelerating down the runway. And you'll see a you know, fairly sizable group of respondents saying, yep, we've used big data. Big data isn't necessarily analytics, by the way, but I'll move on from that. And this one's interesting. Our HL strategy is significantly influenced by a variety of data sources across the organization. And the 73% uh, is the favorable response. The 20% are disagreeing. And the smaller ones are the neutral, can't decide. So for, for me, 
evidence-based HR is about these things with a purpose of seeking to really understand where you can drive value and differentiate and focus on the things of value for your organization. I'm not going to dwell on that because no one can read it, but it's in the pack and it's a maturity curve. But what I will briefly touch upon, I don't think anyone in HR needs to be concerned, worried, frightened about analytics. Uh, we're not seeking the HR profession en masse to be data scientists or statisticians. In fact, I think the most important skill for HR in this world is to both, well, understand that value chain that I mentioned of the business first, but secondly, to frame great questions. Because the analytics that I've seen work in HR functions in big organizations is built around hypotheses, hypotheses that are then tested. And once you've framed your hypothesis, you then know the kinds of data that you might want to go and look at. And actually, the techniques, by and large, these are techniques that have been around for, for decades. You know, we're talking about regression and correlation and clustering. And we can always find someone either in the organization or you find the skills to do the analysis. The key for HR, frame the right question. So identify a business challenge. Develop your hypothesis. Understand your data, what you have and what you need. Analyze the data, and of course, of course, you know, we did some work recently for a big retailer. Uh, we were able to clearly show that actually the branches that were higher performing in a significant way had part-timers in, older part-timers. The stated policy of the HR function to the branch managers was recruit college leavers full-time. On the face of it, that policy was bringing down that organization's performance. The data showed that. And of course, a rather stupid way of following through on that insight is to go and recruit a load of part-timers. Because of course, what the data was doing was pointing you at something that was about the skills that those older people had, about the speed of rapport building, empathy, experience of the products. That was the secret source that would help this organization achieve competitive advantage, not just going and recruiting loads more part-timers. So it, had, it certainly had implications for not only recruitment, but certainly selection and onboarding and training. This stuff about evidence isn't just about your own analytics. It's what's, what's published, what's out there. What is the evidence telling us? You know, some of the heavy thinking has already been done. You just need to go and find it. Then it's about turning it into traction in your organization and continuing to, because this thing about evidence is not a one-off project. It's going on a journey. It is building capability to do this. It is thinking about your operating model. Uh, if you look at the report, there's all sorts of little anecdotes and stories in there. I quite like this one. Royal Bank of Canada, which are, I, I would regard as one of the exemplars in this area, uh, was able to discover a major connection between the degree employees believed in the competitiveness of the value proposition of their business and the performance of that retail branch. Of course, what that led to is a whole bunch of stuff around helping employees really get the economics of the business. 
and be make them not just engaged, but commercially engaged. And finally, um, the, the report says more about the challenges, and there are many, not least the fact that the evidence will challenge a, long, a lot of long-held beliefs and assumptions about what we do and how we do it. I'm going to zip through that and finally say these are the things that we need to get better at. And this middle one is about the, the need to understand our value chains and the real way in which we make money much better and the role of people in that. And finally, the skills required. Peter mentioned systems thinker. I think really understanding causes and effects and how cause and effect aren't necessarily closely related, but you know, there may be a, a whole chain of things that occur. That ability to ask the right questions, persuasive with the, uh, the data, and of course the industry insight. But of course, you know, final point, I said I'd touch upon the dark side I think there is a dark side. I think if we just become solely obsessed with, with numbers in the HR profession, I think that might be a slippery slope to scientific management, something that Peter mentioned. You know, we'll be looking at how people are holding shovels and digging holes. Um, I do wonder about what we do about some of the, like the new HR systems that will tell you flag up the names of people who the algorithm tells you might be at risk of handing the notice in. So what do we do? Do we run around with a bag of swag and say, don't go, when the system tells us that? So I think there are challenges. And one final thought, any of you who've come across the church of the flying spaghetti monster, there is a great, um, very interesting website. You could, Pay it a visit. Uh, there's a great graph there to show a perfect correlation, perfect correlation between the reduction in pirates over the last 300 years and global warming. So this stuff has its limitations. But my argument is we need to make more of it. Have a go. Thank you. So let's have a look, thank you Robert, let's have a look at these questions. Do CEOs pay enough attention to people issues within their organisation? Um, no, is the answer to that one. Um, one quick question, we have a quick question. I think part of my question was this, is, is, is basically what advice would you give to HR directors? How do you start that? Let's just go, how can HR develop more evidence-based skills? I think that's a similar, similar vein. Yeah. How do you actually start this? Because some of this looks quite complex. It, 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 some of it takes out the human of human resources. Um, it can get quite numbers based. I, I, I think I, I, that slide that I, I had there about the steps, that's actually taken from thinking that's kind of like 150 odd years old. It's, it's kind of a variation on the theme of the scientific method. Yeah? Which is why I use the phrase set a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that you can get started in this area is like just doing an experiment. So that retailing organization... Frame a good question. Frame a good question. See if you can get the evidence, the, the, the data, to explore that. A trick, more than a trick, if you frame that question with the business, i.e. it's more the business question business's question that they would like an answer to, mm. we'll then, you're, then you're up and running. Mm. So rather than the HR function going and saying, how about we, we do this? You know, one of the most powerful things we did with the client was just run a half-day workshop with the leadership team around developing the hypotheses that they might want tested. Mm. And uh, this was an oil, uh, an oil and gas company. And, and they were coming out with these amazing things that actually if we could answer the question, it would make a massive difference in terms of health and safety, productivity, oil rig performance, and actually, 70% of the data they had pretty readily available. 
So um, for me, I think, get buy into the question, in fact, get them to give you the question, and then you're up and running. Okay, Robert, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.